Hi, today I'm talking to Aunty Eva Jo Edwards, who's agreed to share some of her story with us. Welcome. And thanks for having us. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm, my name's Eva Jo Edwards. I, um, I don't know. I have six children, seven grandchildren, and I'm a Bunurong, Mari Mari, Yori Yori woman. So tell us a bit about your story. Um, I am the third youngest of 14 children. Seven of those 14 children are my mum's, and um, all seven of us were taken from Swan Hill to Melbourne. Spent a short bit of time in um, Alambi Reception Centre, and then we were moved from there to the Lutheran Children's Home in Sackville Street, Q. So under the Lutheran Children's Home, I was to spend the next 13 years of my childhood. Um, we were moved in 1969, I was five years old, and um, I guess my life changed forever from that day on. I went to the local primary school, um, Deep Dean Primary, and um, yeah, I think I have reasonably good memories of the institution. The institution had about 60 children aged between 0 and 12. Um, it was a very tight ship, I guess, you know. I was lucky enough to be with my baby brother who was about nine months old. My little sister was three, I was five, and my older sister was 10. I guess not having grown up with family, with parents, with community, being part of um, language, culture, identity, not existing, I was somebody that just existed. When you live in an institution that doesn't show you love or care or um, tell you that you don't amount to anything, you know, like we nurture our children. It's, yeah, those things are really hard to deal with when you become an adult. Um, isolation, abandonment, they're huge issues that I still deal with today. In 1975, the institution was shut down. So we were placed in family group homes and um, I got to stay with my little sister. My little brother had been adopted out, so he, he came to live with us a little bit later. But I think that was, that was another big life-changing thing in my life. You know, it was an opportunity to live in a family environment. But, um, you know, my foster mum, Margaret, she's, I think, a lot of my, of who I am is also based upon how she raised me, and she was a pretty extraordinary woman in my life, and a big influence in my life. So, and she's, she too now has passed on. But, um, that was interesting and I think when we moved into these family group homes it was probably when I first probably encountered huge racism. Moving schools, going from Deep Dean Primary to Boxing Primary. And um, I think for me, yeah, that, that was a bit hard. Just that transition in that period of time. But um, went to local high school. Did up to year 11, it's not too bad. My first job was actually Member of Parliament for Croydon as a, as a typist, <laughs> as a typist, um, admin, whatever you want to call it, receptionist. So that was, you know, that was a long time ago, actually. <laughs> um, and then I've worked ever since, ever since I left the homes and I was about 18 and a half. So, and then, you know, I went and got a job with AES, Aboriginal Education Services, that used to sit in Elizabeth Street in the city. Mm -hmm. And then I 
worked in many, many spaces since, and I think at the age of 25, I, I, I got married and had three beautiful little boys. And I had three little boys by the time I was 25, so I sort of hit a, hit a wall, because I looked at my little boys and I just thought, who the heck am I and where do I fit into all of this bigger picture? So I walked out of my marriage and went and found myself, I guess. And, and that was really, really hard, you know, and I think that was my first encounter with depression and, and identity and... You know, because when I first come into community, I was seen as this uppity black who spoke differently, dressed differently, walked differently, I guess. I don't know, because I had a very, very... Not just institutionalised, but very white ways. And that's not my fault. And I've never used it as, you know, anything negative. It's, I was happy with, with who I was. So I struggled with acceptance. And that's where this acceptance stuff came in the sense of not being accepted in my community, but also struggling with acceptance in my non-Aboriginal community, in the white community. So I'm, I'm sort of, you know, caught in this washing machine, if that's what you want to call it, because who am I supposed to be? So a lot of doors were always closed in my face, and it, not knowing, all I knew I was an Edwards, you know, and where that connection came from. And, yeah, I thought, well, my sister, she went back to community really early, and I thought, well, I'll just say I'm her sister. You know, I'll be fine now. It was really, really hard and really, really traumatic. And over my years of, of my passion for stolen generations, it's, it's a common thing for us that were raised institutionalised and raised in foster care, and even those of us that were adopted. You know, I think we... There was a long time our mannerisms were really, really different. But, you know, I guess I am who I am and you either love me or hate me and that's okay. You know, not I don't need to be liked by everybody. And I think, yeah, so my journey, my journey for community has been really, really hard. But now I'm, probably took about 20 years, to be honest, to be actually concreted, to be part of, you know, something that should have been mine rightfully as, as you know, within my birthplace as an Aboriginal child. So how has history impacted on you and your family? Um, the impacts of my, re my removal and, and my institutionalisation has impacted lots on my children. You know, I mean, look, granted they're, um, they're probably success successful children but raising, raising my children when I didn't have the skills, you know, and I, when you're not told that you're loved, you're wanted, you're needed, and that you could be whatever it is you wanted to be, they're the sorts of things that you, you don't do with your children, you know, and, and I wasn't loved, I wasn't hugged, I wasn't kissed, you know, those things, if you don't learn that, as a little child, how are you supposed to know that that's what you do with your children? And, and that, I struggled with that with my children, you know, when my children turned five, I, that's when all the loves and hugs and kisses stopped for my kids, you know, that intimacy that you continuously do with, with, with your kids and yeah, I, I struggle with that every day still today, but that's that's something that I, I, I don't own anymore because my kids have been really amazing in how they 
have ensured that I do that more so with, with them. You know, it's always I love you, it's a, it's a hug or a kiss, goodbye. It's a hug and a kiss as we greet. So I've gotten better with that. And I, and I am so very blessed with my grandchildren and I think I smother my grandkids, but that's okay. Where do you currently work? Um, what do you love about working with community? I'm currently employed by BACA. I work in a program called Narajaran and we work with the National Redress Scheme and 100% of our clients presently um, are stolen generations and I'm in a really, really privileged space to be able to um, have, have people trust me enough with the stories of what has happened to them whilst they were institutionalised in care as a child. What are the issues that stolen generations face? Look, I think the traumas that, that we have endured as children, the, the mental health issues, you know, um, incarceration, high incarceration rates, alcohol, drug, addictions. Um, I think, I don't know how to explain it actually. When, when being, I guess looking at, at, at myself and, and my clients, I think There is so many underlying and layers of, you know, of traumas that we've had to deal with. That sense of belonging, that wanting, that identity of Aboriginality and loss of community, loss of um, family, connection to country, um, our language, being raised in particular ways that um, knowing you were always different, you know, that there was something in here that, that didn't make us white with the assimilation process of, of wanting to raise us in white world, I guess. But the biggest, the biggest issues, and I think it's probably within our community in general, is, is those things that I've mentioned, you know, the, the high incarceration rate, the mental health, but also the, risk, the, the cycle of child removal. You know, a lot of us, due to, you know, being institutionalised, had never been given the skills to raise our children. So what's one stereotype that you would like to break about Aboriginal people? Um, I think there's more than one, but I think first would be um, that you don't look Aboriginal. How can you be Aboriginal? You know, we, 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 spoke, we are supposed to look a particular way, you know, and I think, um, yeah, I have grandchildren that are blonde haired and blue eyed. You know, it doesn't make them any less Aboriginal. So stereotyping, you know, what we should look at as a, we should be as Aboriginal people. But also, you know, I guess there's, there is so many more than one, but also the fact that Aboriginal people don't work. We're all on Centrelink. We're all in public housing. We're all alcoholics and, and addicts and, you know, we as Aboriginal people, we're very smart, clever people, you know. We own our own homes. We, you know, are CEOs in our organisations. We um, have worked our entire lives. We, we do hold down great jobs. And I think they are the, you know, stereotypes that I, you know, would like to just let people know that, you know, I'm someone that's worked my entire life. You know, I have 
raised six kids on my own and have worked full time. And I just sort of think that we need to, you know, remember that Aboriginal people are resilient, we are strong, we are amazing people. How do you define Aboriginality? I define that Aboriginality and, and me as an Aboriginal person of what I feel inside, what my connections are, you know. I, I for many years, I've been here in, in Melbourne since I was five. And I have, my connection to country here is probably my strongest, even though I'm from South East Australia. So I think it's not about the colour of our skin. It's not about the colour of our eyes and the colour of our hair. Aboriginality is something that we feel. So what advice would you give someone who's just found out about their Aboriginality and wants to know more? Where should they start looking? Look, I think finding out your connection, you know, to, to you know, your ancestry is really, really important. We have um, organisations, you know, within Melbourne and, and Victoria where you can go to help with your Aboriginality. Um, I think it's about finding the connections of where you're from, you know, your family, you know, it's, it's Kuri Heritage Trust Family History Program to me is one really great place that helped me with, with my family history and my connections to, to all the, you know, families that I am connected to. So what advice would you give young Aboriginal adolescents that want to know more about culture? Where should they start or what should they be doing? Oh, look. I think firstly is, is looking for, you know, Aboriginal people that are already within our community and that are engaging. You know, I think we have a lot of, a lot of organisations around. We have a lot of sporting groups around. We have, reconciliation has been a really big thing, I think, you know. The museum too. What's it called? Bunjalaka. Bunjalaka have some amazing, you know, information. They also have that little history part. You know, it's it's engaging in co-ops where those opportunities arise. It's when you have guest speakers that come to your school, you know, to your universities, to your workplace. You know, it's 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 being strong in wanting to actually. Um, venture outside your your um, comfort zone, you know, and it's and it's like you said before, if, if your parents and your grandparents have been disconnected and removed, you know, it's it's about you finding that inner strength to be able to sit down and talk to a, an older person, you know, a, an elder, if you can get that opportunity. How do you define the qualities of an Aboriginal elder? An elder, how do we define our elders? Me personally, I, an elder is somebody that I respect. I, I do consider an elder being older than me. I, and I've been very blessed to have some amazing elders, you know, in my, in my journey. I don't believe that it is something that just because you turn a particular age, that does not define you. It's your contribution to community, it's contribution to your family, it's how you've contributed to, to you know, to ensure that there are um, good things that you've done. So what's the take home message you, you'd like people to actually walk away with? Um, you know what, everybody has a story and every story is different. And, and I, I think we're, we're, for me, it, it is about stolen generations. And I, I like to look at it and I like to think that 
through all of what we have had to endure as children for choices that were made for us and placed us into positions I um, would like to think that all those things that were done to us don't define us on who we are. I, I see us as survivors, I see us as strong, resilient, amazing people who um, have had their backs against the wall and um, are still here to tell a story. Look, Andy, thank you for agreeing to talk to us today. It's been a pleasure as always talking to you. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Give me a great right day. Thank, thank you. you.